My name is Joy. I'm a clinical anatomy research fellow here at the Seattle Science Foundation. And today I'm going to be talking about supernumerary abducens nerve. And that's, um, it, it's a comprehensive review that I've written uh, that's in review for publication right now. So I'll start off with the anatomy of the abducens nerve. Um, sorry, I wasn't aware that there was going to be so many people here with varying levels. So um, I didn't go through uh, the more basic things. So here um, I'm going to describe what you're seeing. This is the posterior view of the clivus. And if you can imagine that the brainstem is um, right here, it would be right here. And so the abducens actually comes out of the pontomedullary sulcus of the ventral brainstem. And it travels anteriorly and superiorly towards the clivus, where it pierces the dura. And you can see where it pierces the dura here. Um, it is at the location of the petroclinoid ligament. Oh, I guess the pointer is not showing. So this is the petroclinoid ligament. And this ligament is also called the Gruber's ligament. And um, it forms a canal that's called the Dorello's canal. So as the abducens travel within this canal into the cavernous sinus, it crosses laterally over the internal carotid artery. And it travels anteriorly towards the superficial, uh, super, superior orbital fissure and it attaches to the lateral rectus muscle, which, as Dr. Tubbs mentioned, moves the eye laterally. It abduct, abducts your eye. So this pathway is the norm and the most commonly seen in um, the population. However, multiple variations have been found, and the literature reports it to be 5 to 28.6%. And no other cranial nerve displays such frequent variation. And actually, replications of nerves within the body is quite rare. So Dr. Tubbs actually has a, a study done on accessory nerve duplication. And within a sample size of 112 cadavers, uh, only two duplications were found. So with this kept in mind, as, uh, with the long and complex intracranial route that the abducens has, it's um, commonly vulnerable to iatrogenic injury, and that, that's like injury due to uh, hospital procedures. And it's also uh, at risk for neurovascular interactions with its surrounding structures. So this is part of the reason why abducens nerve palsy, which is a deficit of your abducens nerve, is the most common extraocular nerve palsy. So when you have this palsy, you can't move your, you have difficulty moving your eyes horizontally, like laterally. So with all these kept in mind, um, it is, it's clear that uh, it warrants, these variation warrants further investigation. So a brief history on the studies that have been done so far is that studies range from case reports to large cadaveric studies, with the earliest papers dating from 1929. However, going through the literature, you see that there's issues in quantifying these results, namely the nomenclature. Uh, several authors use different nomenclature to uh, describe what they're seeing. So one author will use branching, the author, the, another author will use duplication. So it's kind of unclear what you're really talking about unless you have a uniform nomenclature. As well, there's um, a, an issue with sample quantification. Certain authors use um, per eye versus a per person way to count the variations that they see. Um, as well, certain authors use classifications that are different. So there's one study where they use um, the designated patterns to the variations that they see and naming them from pattern one to five, whereas another study, they will use positional descriptions to talk about the variations that they see. So the issue is how do you describe these variants when there's so many possibilities? You can have a single nerve coming from the brainstem, then splitting, or you can end reun reuniting, or you can have two uh, completely separate nerve roots coming from the brainstem, traveling separately or joining at some point. So with this study, um, I went through all the studies and made a table of the different units that they used, the results that they found, and um, how any additional notes that were uh, relevant. 
So for the sake of time, I'll go through one or two of the studies in this table. So in Jane et al., which is the first, uh, first row in the table, he used 300 cadavers, and he only found 18 cases where there was a duplication. And 17 of these cases, the, uh, the nerve would come out as duplicates, but join within the cavernous sinus. And only one was a duplicate in the entire length. And in this case, Jane counted by case, so it's per person, whereas some of the other studies counted per eye. And Nathan et al. and Osverin et al. were two of the um, authors who designated patterns to their the variations that they see. So they, um, Nathan et al. started the designation pattern with from one to four in that they see they designated pattern one as a single trunk, two as a single trunk that bifurcates in the prepontine cistern, and then rejoins, and three, um, a nerve that originates as two trunks, then rejoins, and four as a duplication in the entire pathway. And Osverin added to this um, by adding type five and type six. Those are more studies. And there's also quite a number of case reports where incidental findings of these variations were reported. Most of them were um, incidental, they were asymptomatic, and the imaging was only done um, in investigation for another uh, pathology. So <clears throat> it becomes clear that a more precise and uniform method for describing, classifying, and quantifying these variants is needed. So how do we describe them? Um, in the paper, I propose a terminology, the use of these terminology that root or trunk will only, uh, will only be used to designate a nerve that's originating from the brainstem, whereas the tail end is the nerve attaching to the lateral rectus. And branching is only used as a term to uh, signify a single nerve that splits as a specific location. And bifurcation and trifurcation is a single nerve that splits into two or three branches, respectively whereas replication is a complete separate copy of the nerve originating from the root. And duplication and triplication will, um, will refer to two or three of these um, separate branches originating from the brainstem. And to use this terminology in combination with the positional descriptors and pattern designation from several of the other studies, I think would make it much more clear and precise in order to both um, designate where the variations occur and the type of variations that you see. So uh, this is an image from Ayaconera et al. where they separated the anatomic locations of the abducens nerve course into five separate um, locations and they describe them as cisternal, golfer, cavernous, fissural, and intracona. <coughs> so the results of the study um, is that the most common is the normal pathway, which ranges from 70 to 90%. And if there is a variation, the most common variation is a single root bifurcating in a prepontine cistern, piercing the dura separately, usually above and below Dorello's canal and reuniting within the cavernous sinus. And the rarest variation would be a duplicated or triplicated nerve innervating the lateral rectus separately. And as I mentioned, in the in vivo variations have, um, that I found in the literature have been asymptomatic that were only found incidentally. So some images, uh, just to give you uh, orientation, this again is the clivus. And uh, that, those are the ocular motor nerves, trigeminal nerves. And these would be the facial and vestibular cochlear nerves. And you can see that on the left side, there's a duplicated abducens nerve. And this picture is a bit unclear whether or not um, it's a branching or a duplication because the brainstem has been removed. This one, um, it's clearly a bifurcated abducens nerve on the right um, because you can see that it originates from a single strand and then splits into two. And this is an example of a bifurcated abducens nerve with interneural connection. So the vertical arrow is the inter, interneural connection, and these two are the bifurcated abducens nerve. 
and the blue arrow is denoting the lateral rectus muscle. So how does this occur? Um, looking through the literature, only very few authors offer theories of why this happens. Most of them just document the variations. What is known is that cranial nerves 3 to 6 and 12 make up the somatic efferent group that's embryologically derived from the ventral lamina of the midbrain. And it's also known that some adducens nerve fibers travel rostrally through the median longitudinal fasciculus. Um, this uh, fasciculus helps coordinate bilateral eye movements. So um, some adducens nerve fibers travel through there to reach the ocular motor nuclei in order to do its job. So with these two facts that are known, um, some authors postulate that, uh, for example, Edgewater postulated that abducens nerve is actually an extension of the ocular motor nuclei. And this uh, theory actually helps Tillak explain the case report that he reported on, which is a patient with a double ocular motor nerve, but a missing abducens nerve on, uh, unilaterally. So this patient had uh, normal function of extraocular muscles, normal functioning of eye movements and vision, but he just had two ocular motor nerves and a missing abducens. So Tillak postulated that in this case, um, the patient's abducens nerve traveled rostrally, and instead of exiting where the abducens nuclei is, it exited uh, at the ocular motor nerve, uh, ocular motor nuclei. Um, and staining of, uh, staining for both nuclei showed that both nuclei were present. So, and another author postulates that the reason why variations are seen is that during normal development, aberrant nerve growth occurs. And while you develop, these aberrant nerves are supposed to resorb. And failure to do so is what causes the variations. And why does it matter? So the clinical relevance is, relevance is that um, abducens nerve palsy is the most common extraocular nerve palsy. And it has several causes, including intracranial hypo, hypertension, aneurysm, ligament entrapment, and surgical procedures. So perhaps learning more about these variations can help us reduce the risk of abducens nerve palsy. As well, there could be a correlation with risk of strabismus and other extraocular pathologies um, involved with these variations. For example, in Duane's syndrome, where patients have a defect in horizontal eye movements, um, it's been shown that their EMGs show aberrant and or reduced firing from their abducens nerve. However, there hasn't been a study done on um, MRIs of their uh, cranial nerves, whether or not they have variations and if they correlate with their EMG findings. And like I said, most of the variation, variations were found incidentally, so it's difficult to kind of justify extra imaging just to find these variations when patients are asymptomatic. So future studies would be, um, it would be interesting to see exact, systematically investigate whether the exact innervation and functional patterns of these variation and how, whether or not they can be protective. For example, does having extra branches or uh, extra strands, um, can they protect you from palsy? Like if you sacrifice one branch, will you still have perfect functioning of your lateral rectus muscle? Or does it actually uh, render the muscle de uh, dependent on these extra nerve that causes them to be significantly weakened when one is cut? So Clark et al. and Goldberg et al. actually uh, both conducted studies that leans towards the fact that fully intact ner uh, abducens nerve and lateral rectus muscle functioning are not necessary for um, good functioning of horizontal eye movements. And possible studies in the future are to compare lateral rectus muscle EMGs of patients who have abducens var variants and compare them to the norm. And there's also, um, I, I think it would be also interesting to see 
in patients with abducens nerve palsy or Duane syndrome and to do the MRI imaging of their extraocular cranial nerves in conjunction with EMGs of their extraocular muscles to see or whether or not they would uh, have some sort of correlation. I think these studies can elucidate how these variations may contribute or prevent extraocular pathologies. Well, that's my talk. <laughs> Thank you. Those are my references. So also, since I'm up here, I wanted to take the time to say a special thank you to Dr. Iwanaga and Dr. Tubbs. <laughs> um, so Dr. Iwanaga has been a great friend and educator. Every time we're in the lab, he's always excited to teach us and tell us everything that he's working on. So I really appreciate that. And of course, Dr. Tubbs, <laughs> without your brilliance and generosity, none of us would be here. So I truly appreciate the privilege of working with you. And um, thank you for always being the carrot rather than the stick. <laughs> yeah, and I don't have that many photos of them, but I think these photos really exemplify what it's like to work with them. Not only are they extremely knowledgeable, but they're just, they're just genuinely excited to teach and innovate advanced medical education and clinical research. So it's been a fantastic experience working with you both. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lastly. <laughs> Great talk, Joy. I also wanted to thank everyone here at SSF for being so welcoming and supportive. Um, some of the people aren't here, but Dr. Askuyan, Kevin, Hisako, Gary, Jason, Lee, Clara, all the fellows. Unfortunately, I don't have photos with everybody, but I've had an extremely fun and rewarding time here. So thank you very much. I hope I'll get to work with you guys again. <laughs>